All right, hello everyone, and welcome to California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines with our host, Elaine Chacon Brown. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. So for the month of July, the California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines video series uh, is focusing on California in the global context, bringing in thought leaders in wine from across disciplines to weigh in on the state of California wine on the world stage. The goal of these conversations is to lend perspective from the outside in so that the international and domestic trade audience gains a more comprehensive view of the Golden State's wine industry, past, present, and future. Today, we have the privilege to welcome Dr. Jamie Good. So before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants that we encourage you to use, a chat section as well as a Q&A section. These are different. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. So just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. And then there's the Q&A section. And this is where we'd like you to submit your questions for Elaine and Jamie to answer during the webinar. We will do our best to address your questions, but please know any that are not answered live will be provided in the Q&A summary in the email you'll receive following the program. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine. In addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American specialist for JancisRobinson.com and contributes to a long list of respected publications. She serves, she contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently, as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. She was named by the International Wine and Spirits Competition and Vid Italy as one of the world's top five wine communi communicators of the year for the last two years in the row. And Jamie. Jamie is a London-based uh, wine writer and author. He writes for his wine blog, uh, Wine Anorak, as well as a long list of respected publications. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Elaine. Jamie. Super good to see you. Hey, great to see you, Elaine. <laughs> How's it going? It's good, yeah. It's good. a beautiful evening here, so I'm sitting outside. Good. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it's a lot of fun to be able to speak with you from California to London. So thanks for being with us this week. Great. So one of the things I want to start with is just, um, you know, you have built a reputation as a wine expert, um, certainly through writing, but also through speaking. And part of what's interesting about kind of your presence in the wine world today is that you're, you're really known for speaking to uh, what we might call lower intervention wines, which we'll talk about today, but certainly also kind of natural wines, broadly speaking. But your background actually is in lab biology. And I think one of the things that, um, that is interesting about that is that in the world of wine, people often assume that those with technical training only pursue technical um, practices. So, and, and that's something you and I have spent time talking about. Sometimes the fact that, uh, that additions, as another example, the fact that additions are allowed in wine, people often assume mean the additions are used in wine. But actually, um, technical training can simply be kind of a, a form of insight rather than a demanded approach. And I think additions that can serve in that kind of role as well. Could you speak, um, just to get us started, could you speak to that tension of kind of technical training versus the choices that are made? That's um, an excellent question. And I know I'm going to get excellent questions from you, which is always, always fun taking part of these things with you. So so my background, I did a PhD in plant biology. So I've worked in, you know, research job and then then I worked for 15 years as a science editor. Um, and it was kind of an odd job in the sense that I, was, I worked for a scientific charity that, that hosted high-end meetings, 80 year, on topics all around life sciences, including agriculture, occasionally. More, more commonly, biomedical sciences. And so we'd have these 25 world exports to decennial London or would go to somewhere else in the world and have an intensive three-day closed meeting. And what that did was it kind of made me 
kind of scientifically literate in lots of different fields. You know, I was dipping my toes in other people's research. And that perspective, I think, was what really triggered a lot of curiosity for me. So with science, I've, I've, yes, I've got a technical background, but it kind of makes you realize that there's so many unanswered questions and that our, our understanding of the world around us, even though science is incredibly powerful and has done great things, our understanding is pretty incomplete. Mm-hmm. And nowhere more is that, is that more evident than when it comes to viticulture. And so that the technical approach to vineyards that was more, more, more common maybe 15 years ago, you know, using good chemical solutions to all the problems and regarding the vine as just the crop plant and then just thinking of the soil as an inert medium and then obliterating everything else with chemicals is basically um, not very scientific at all. And the more sort of um, the approach that we're seeing increasingly now where people regard the vineyard as an agro ecosystem, we have regenerative agriculture, we're looking at not just having the vine as the focus, but farming the soils as well, actually is much more scientific because it's, it's built on a more complete understanding of what's taking place in the vineyard and especially under the soils well, and I all the that... biological interactions within the vineyard. So, so really the more scientific you are, the, the more you tend to embrace what's seen in some circles as being less scientific of an approach. And I think the same is true with um, fermentation. So, um, Wine is a microbiological product. Um, it's not made by people in wineries. It's made by organisms, microorganisms, bacteria and yeasts. And the biology of you know, bacteria and yeast is very complex. And, in, and, and couple that with the, the biology of the grapevine, the composition of the grape berry, mm. and then the, the, the processes that take place um, you know, through viticulture, through winemaking to produce um, the wine at the end, you know, the elevage process, you know, how the wine is brought up. All these things are, you know, very complex. And there's a lot of biology there. The more technical you get, I think, the more you respect that biology and the less you want to mess around with it and compress it by um, using interventionist techniques. Right. And I think that, that ultimately that's, that's how I square it. It's actually what I'm trying to be is more scientific because I think the more scientific you are, the more you respect the biology because this is, after all, a biological product. Well, and so I think, wine, wine is not winemaking is not chemistry; it's biology. Right, right. And um, you know, there's a, there's so many things we can tease apart in that. But one of the key things I think is people often fail to see science is actually a practice done over time, and it's a way of approaching the world, a way of engaging with the complexity of the world. Where other than I think sometimes in wine conversations, science is misunderstood as technical interventions. But that's actually a mm-hmm. moment of choice to apply a specific type of um, practice or, or intervention rather than being science itself. Science is a way of study and engaging. But one of the things that, you know, to getting to your point about, you know, wine is made, wine is a microbiological product, like really people are guiding wine making rather than actually making wine in a way, you yeah. know, um, because like, as you're saying, wine is made at a microbiological level, people just guide that process and can intervene to varying degrees. But one of the things that that points out too is that, um, you know, there's been more and more conversation around the idea of being able to make wine in a less interventionist way. But something I don't see pointed out enough is that that conversation is also exactly paralleled an increase in seeing wine with less ripeness um, or being picked mm. earlier. And the, and the microbiology around ripeness directly correlates to differing pH levels and acidity levels and things like that. So could you speak to that, that kind of interaction of ripeness and um, the, the need to intervene? So I think that, that's another great question. So I think that I'm, I, in my last sort of um, comment, I didn't, don't want to negate the role of a skilled wine grower um, because to do, nothing, to do nothing and to result with something that's interesting requires a great deal of skill. And even the natural guys in Beaujolais are looking down the microscope. You know, they're going there, looking down the microscope to see what's there, especially after alcoholic fermentation is finished. And if there's... You know, if there's bad things there, you know, if the wrong sort of bacteria are there, 
they'll intervene. You know, intervention is not bad itself. It's just unnecessary intervention. But your point about ripeness is really good because I think what happened is there were a whole series of factors um, that conspired together to, to see um, a widespread, um, basically um, a, just a widespread sort of like almost pattern of winemaking with elevated alcohol levels, with riper grapes. And part of it was a stylistic choice. People thought, well, these wines are more delicious because they're riper and they're fuller. And part of it is um, a sort of a, you know, a, 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 an effect from, you know, viticultural changes that have, you know, that have, that, you know, replanting of vineyards with, with, you know, um, vines that are just pumping more sugar into the grapes. It's a little bit more complex than that, but it's like, yeah. it's not always a stylistic choice. It's sometimes it's right. a viticultural effect and you, you know, to get the, the, the grapes at the right sort of ripeness, you're picking them later. And, I think what happened is that it was almost like a pendulum swing too far. Because in the old days, you know, in classic European wine regions, the issue was getting the grapes ripe. So a lot of the Bordeaux consultants um, became famous because they actually managed to get proper ripeness, you know, before, before the, um, the wines were underripe. And it was a problem. And they really were um, moved out of that, you know, that, that, that sort of window of ripeness. Um, but then suddenly these Bordeaux consultants move across to very different climates and Im implement the same sort of policies pick later pick later you know wait for the the physiological or psychological ripeness i sometimes call it you know and hold on before you harvest and when you pick later what you end up with often is you end up moving away from making a wine of place with distinctive local character towards making a wine of style i think this is sashi mormon that said this to me once you know this he says either way if you pick too early or pick too late you end up making a wine of style rather than a wine of place. So depending on the variety and the location, there's a window, it might be smaller, it might be broader, where you can make a really interesting wine that has a, a sense of place about it. And if you leave either side of those, you know, if you right. go too far in terms of ripeness or you pick too early, it's a stylistic wine. And some of the natural wines that I tasted are kind of gone into that stylistic direction where they just taste like smashable glue glue wines that you can drink and they're delicious. But I couldn't tell you where it's, whether it's from the Loire or Provence, you know. Well, and it's so, important to, if you don't mind me intervening just for a second, it's important to point out here, those smashable glue glue wines can be super worth drinking really fun. And the riper, you know, more hedonistic wines can be super worth drinking really fun. But the point we're making is that they become wines of style rather than site-specific, regionally expressive wines. Yeah, and I'm not... So I'm not making a moral point here. If you like right. wines that are, that are a bit riper, and also mood drinking is right. I mean, some days I like a ripe wine, and some days I like a lean wine. Yeah. Um, but I, I really, if a, if a place is interesting, and I think a lot of Californian wine regions have got interesting sites that are kind of unique. So if you have the possibility of making a wine that has characteristics that are unique to that place that can't be emulated anywhere else, then I would say it's, generally quite a good idea to try and hit that the window where you're reflecting that place rather than some stylistic intent or some 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 over enthusiastic work in the winery and i think the issue with overripeness particularly is that it's very hard then not to intervene if you've yeah. got grapes coming in very very high bricks um usually the acidity will be a bit lower so you probably have to add some tartaric acid you know in some countries it's almost routine to do tar tartaric acids Adds like in say the Barossa Valley or something, everything's corrected to pH 3.56, you know, and um, with quite a bit of tartaric acid, and that's just the way it is. And then, then if you've got a, a, a high sugar must and you're going to go to potentially high alcohol levels, often the, the nutrients you need to add some, some yeast nutrients, some nitrogen source. Um, so you start having to get the chemical bag of tricks out to make sure those fermentations go through to completion. So it's a, it's, it's a complicated thing. Um, so, you know, by picking later, you are generally going to have to intervene more. And, and although a skilled wine grower can intervene more and still produce a really nice wine at the end, generally speaking, it's, it's just better if you don't. It's just, I just find it much more satisfying if the wine hasn't been messed around with too much. Well, and one, one thing just to sum up uh, the kind of technical point is just to say the riper the wine often the higher the pH and higher pH wines are generally less stable, which is why then 
more intervention needs to be done in the cellar. But I want to make sure we get talking about the wines because the thing I love about having you here today is like you and I could just like keep going on this conversation and I want us to do that. But I also want to make sure we, we look at actual wine examples. And the first wine that you selected actually is a perfect segue because we're talking here about Copan um, Chardonnay and it's specifically um, the wine that we've selected is specifically Copan Chardonnay from Anderson Valley because it's a really great example of how you know, as these conversations evolved over time and people are wanting to um, kind of shift their focus on the ripeness question, we end up with, um, with at the same time, producers looking to less, lesser known areas, further afield areas. Anderson Valley has been around for quite a while, but it's become this hallmark of cooler climate, coastally influenced wine. It's better known for Pinot, but we actually intentionally chose Chardonnay because I think Chardonnay is one of the, one of the great uh, varieties for the region and really emerge from there. So, um, but, but Copan also as, as a brand really correlates with this point that um, around ripeness and, and California of course created the IPOB movement. And I know you have really interesting views about the influence of that on the world. So could you speak to kind of that conversation, the way IPOB um, in, in pursuit of balance, you know, yes. um, plays into this conversation. I mean, I've taken a part, part in a couple of seminars with the in pursuit of balance team, one in London, one in two in London and one in um, San Francisco. And I found it a very exciting movement because um, C California in the past is, you know, it went through a phase where it was, and I think slightly unfairly associated with excess, excessive ripeness, too much of this, too much of that. Um, and I think it was really a, a, a really interesting movement because it's like-minded people who maybe stepped away from what they considered personally to be excess of their own making. So the, the, the guy who founded um, Copain as well as Guthrie started out making quite big ripe wines and then had a change of, um, a change of heart, a change, change of style and suddenly started making these wines in a much more compressed, lean, earlier picked mm -hmm. way. And, and like others, like um, we'll, we'll come to Adam Tolmach of um, Ohio as well, did a similar sort of thing. Um, and they got hammered by the critics for making this change of style. And, you know, so it was a very brave thing to do. And so there's a whole bunch of these guys who started, you know, making wines where they're looking for restraint and balance. And some of them did indeed flirt with making wines that maybe picked a little bit too early. But in, on the whole, I think most of them were suddenly making more compelling wines. And so it really resonated hearing these stories of, of the journey that people are going, because we're all going on a journey with wine. I mean, we all change up our styles, our preferences, we're curious about new experiences. And so, you know, it's not a judgmental thing to say, I've been on a journey and this is where I am now. And I think that the, they were careful not to be too judgmental of people who are making wines in another style. Although the, I think some of the people who did make wines in the other style felt this perceived slight, you know, because yeah. they, they're saying their wines are balanced, you're saying my wines are unbalanced. So that, that, that's, that's one of the, the challenges with this Whole, whole project but it it was a time limited project it went for I think five or six years and there were seminars and tastings and what it did I think it, it gave everyone a chance to think it's like you know what am I doing am I picking too late could I pick a little bit more early you know could I could I bit a bit earlier could I um you know do I really need to do so much in the winery what if I try a less interventionist approach and I think that even people who would never have joined this this movement decided to, to rethink some of their practices. And yes, some of them rethought them and said, no, actually we're on the right lines. But others I think have, have, have re really reconsidered what they're doing. And now I think across the whole wine industry, we're seeing a lot more open discussion about adding things to wine and whether those additions are really needed. Well, and so I think it's had, a, it's had a wider effect than just the movement itself. Right. One of the things that you've said to me before is that you see IPOB as California kind of instigating the public conversation around these issues, yeah. you know, so that this conversation around, you know, what, what degree of ripeness is appropriate, 
how much do we need to intervene in the cellar, what is proper growing in the vineyard, really actually get triggered here in California, but then yes. actually have an influence around the world. Yes, I think Calif it gave California a leadership role in this discussion about restraint and ripeness. And I think that that's one of the thing, Calif things that California, I think, has been really good at, is, is taking a sort of leadership role and, and forging, you know, making, forging new ground. And then, then the ripple effect, as, as some of those ideas spread out, even back to the, the traditional bastions of, you know, the heartland of fine wine. Because I think a lot of these conversations are happening in Bordeaux now. Um, right. Well, so, so just, it, it, just to give some historical context to people that are watching, because uh, remarkably, some, some people, people are always entering the wine industry at different stages. And so some people came in after IPOB and so are not aware of it. So just to quickly give context to that, IPOB was uh, in pursuit of balance. And it was a group that formed in 2010. It lasted just five years. They disbanded after 2015. But it was uh, started originally focused entirely on Pinot, but also on Chardonnay. And the idea was to bring together producers from California who made wines in a fresher, lighter, earlier picked style. And um, there were producers doing this, but the big thing that IPOB did was actually kind of give a focal point to the conversation. It actually brought a group together so that a conversation actually could occur rather than having just these different isolated producers. And the reason that that mattered was because the public conversation at the time was really um, on a kind of more modern um, style that was riper in comparison. And IPOB came out and rather controversially asserted the point, California can do less ripeness as well. And, um, Copan is such an interesting case too. this, you know, I want to make sure we actually talk about the wine. Ryan Zapaltis is the, is the winemaker today with Copan. And I love what he's doing with exploring Chardonnay from Anderson Valley. It's such a um, example of being able to pick earlier and still capture so much flavor. Uh, you know, it's, the wine is crunchy. There's this really strong mineral element, but there's still so like also a lot of pure fruit. And I think that, that, um, you know, that's a really nice example of balance in this style. But can you speak a little bit to, uh, you know, you've commented on that, that kind of journey that Guthrie went on through Copan and any other comments you want to make about why this wine specifically? I just think, um, I think it's, it's, first of all, it's not crazy expensive by California standards, which I appreciate. I think it's 36 bucks. Um, and I think it, it really delivers. And I love yeah. that there's this beautiful crystalline sort of citrus character. Um, yeah, we use the word mineral, but it's, it's, got, it's got a bright acidity. It's got a, a really like long tapering finish that, that kind of, I think it's a wine that, that um, for me is one of those wines that, yeah, I'm enjoying it now, but I think it's one of those wines you could, you could stash away for a few years yeah. and will develop in interesting ways. It'll put on a little bit of weight get some extra character um but uh, yeah i think it's it's a a really good example of of a you know a, a classically fine wine by any standard you know it's it's just hitting it's not it's not gone it's got this compressed restrained character but as you say it's not lacking in flavor yeah which i getting that combo is is sort of where the magic is you know so one of the questions that's coming in though uh, people are asking about the role of botrytis in relation to white wine. So a region like Anderson Valley, many of the very coastal parts of California get a lot of fog influence, which means that something like botrytis could form in some cases. But, but um, you know, that's not traditionally used with Chardonnay, but it's, it brings up this interesting tension of, um, I take it one of the stylistic goals of this particular wine, this Copan Chardonnay, is something like precision, there, like that crystalline element that you br bring up, that there's a sense of clarity. Botrytis, in my mind, can be incredibly pleasurable, but it also, in a wine like this, would obscure that sense of clarity. But nevertheless, to remove something like botrytis clusters is certainly a form of intervention at picking. Do you want to comment on 
how you see the relationship of those things. There's a stylistic choice being made in removing something like Botrytis clusters. Yeah, I think, I think the way I see it is that there's no such thing as terroir in the sense that terroir doesn't just happen. It's always an interpretive act. So it requires a human interaction there. Um, you've got to interpret your place. And so the choices you make, that you have to make choices. You have to choose when to pick for a start. Then you have to choose whether, whether to sort and what to sort, which grapes to use, which grapes to put together as well. Because, you know, it's not always the case that all the grapes from one vineyard site, you know, this is issue of scale, will go into the same cuvee. You might have, you might split the vineyard in three or you might combine three vineyards. So these are all choices um, which are about interventions that, that are basically forming that interpretation of the site that you're doing and you can make you know one terroir can give you three or four different interpretations and they can all be intelligent interpretations or two can be sensible interpretations and two mm. can be daft mm. so i think so i think that i'm not anti-intervention what i'm anti is anti inappropriate intervention or unthinking intervention or unskilled intervention right so i think there's that, that's you know the, the issue of botrytis is quite an interesting one because i think you know, some varieties do manage a little bit of botrytis quite well. I mean, Riesling is an ob obvious example where there's often a bit of botrytis in, 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 the, in the mix. Um, but, um, you know, and Chardonnay can get away with it because often with Chardonnay, a lot of it's to do with what you do at pressing. So with Chardonnay at pressing, um, often you won't bother protecting the must from oxygen. It'll just go a murky brown colour. And then through fermentation, all that murkiness goes away and the colour goes away and the wine's pretty much much more stable after it because all the phenolics have been oxidised. But with something like Sauvignon Blanc, it's common to use um, inert gas and dry ice to keep away oxygen during pressing. Um, so, so whether you've got um, botrytis there or, or not matters a great deal because if you've got botrytis there and you're, and you're going the inert route, then you, you're really risking quite a lot because the botrytis has these enzymes called polyphenol right. oxidases. One of them is called lacase, and they're just chemical oxidizers. Right. So you're going to get chemically oxidized. If you're trying to keep the gap, the uh, everything away and you're getting the wine chemically oxidized, you'll lose all those aromatic compounds right. that you're looking to preserve. So it depends on the variety a lot. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, so we want to keep moving forward with the different wines and kind of, you know, the second wine that you've selected is uh, Pinot Noir from Ojai. And I think that that actually dovetails really nicely here because the kind of red wine parallel to what we were just discussing would be something like whole cluster, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, you actually in your career have spent quite a bit of time thinking on the role of whole cluster and, and, um, yeah. and also literally tasting with producers and sort of examining the work that we're, they're doing. And the specific wine we've selected from Ojai is fully de-stemmed. So, so just to be clear, there is no whole cluster in this particular Pinot. But, you know, as we get ready to talk about the wine itself, could you speak to, again, that same kind of tension? The choice of using whole cluster or not, it, it, it is a choice. It is certainly a kind of intervention. And there are really very disparate views on does whole cluster allow for or obscure something like terroir expression or site expression? Yeah. So whole cluster is a really interesting topic um, just to explain it. So obviously when you pick a bunch of grapes, that's the cluster. Um, and so I'd say it's probably most common in red wine making to de-stem before fermentation. So you take the berries off and you might um, de-stem and crush or you might just de-stem and have the berries more or less intact. And there's a whole, we could talk for ages about all these choices, but the, the choice of whole, whole cluster is very interesting because um, for Pinot Noir especially, this is a, this is a really interesting um, um, decision point as to whether you de-stem or not. Um, and also, there's not just one way of doing whole cluster. It's quite common for people to do maybe 10 or 20% whole cluster. And if you see on the back of the label, a percentage of whole cluster. What's interesting is that, you know, they don't tell you whether, say if it's 20% whole cluster, they don't tell you that there were five fermenters and one of them was 100% whole cluster, or whether there was 20% whole clusters Throughout, put in each of yeah. the fermenters and then topped up with de-stem berries. 
and that makes a difference. And like some people do things like lasagna, so they'll do a whole cluster destemmed, whole cluster destemmed in layers. And some people will even do whole cluster where they put the berries at the bottom and the whole cluster at the top. And often they say that's a good because if if they don't like the way it's going with the whole cluster, they can just take those off, destem them, and put them back in. Um, so what's the difference with whole cluster? Well, what happens is that you get a little bit of fermentation within the berry. It's not really fermentation, it's enzymic reactions. So, that, so when you press a whole cluster ferment, there's some, some of the berries will still be intact. And this has a number of effects. First of all, having the stems in the, um, in the ferment gives a little bit of flavor from the stems. It also it keeps the fermentation down, temperature down, which is an important factor as well. Mm -hmm. It creates channels when you press as well. It's, it's very interesting. Um, and, and it's often a, a lot depends on how you then manage that whole cluster because with, with, a, with um, V-stem berries, what's that common is to punch down um, or pump over. Um, with a whole cluster, sometimes if it's 100% whole cluster, you can't really punch down as much. And so you're doing more of an infusion. You're just keeping the cap wet. So actually, there's a lot of really interesting choices. And stylistically, um, that was a question, what about l l levels of living lignification in the, 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 um, yeah. the stems? So, Super so yeah. obviously, this, this is a very controversial area because a lot of people say you have to have brown stems, lignified stems. But in most regions, if you, do, if you look, wait for brown stems, you're going to have the grapes far too overripe. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people who don't mind green stems, they're just very gentle with them because they think it's the mashing them around that gives you the green flavors in the wine. And a lot of this depends on the region you're in. A lot of it depends on the vintage. So some people actually take the, the, the cluster and bite into the, right, bite into the cluster, into the green bit, to see, to see just from their experience, do they want to use the stems this time or not? And some people do even crazy things. Like I know a guy in South Africa who takes the stem, de-stems, takes the stems, then lets them dry, dries them out, but he uses a flamethrower to kind of help them dry out and then puts them back into the ferment. Right. So there's so many variations of what you can do, but generally speaking, the flavor impact of, of whole cluster is you sometimes get a little bit more greenness, you get a bit more structure, but you often get more freshness as well. And so it's a way of working in a warm climate to bring freshness into the wine. It can be really interesting. Right. Well, so let's be sure to um, talk about the specific Pinot that we have here. And it's actually, I'm quite excited to hear your thoughts on this Pinot because, you know, as you mentioned, Ojai uh, with Adam Tolmack is another example of a, of a winemaker or a winery that, that really went through a significant journey of and shifting perspective around the style of wine he was making. And interestingly, this specific Pinot actually re reflects that in a different way in that, um, you know, Adam has always been very invested in um, wines from Santa Barbara County, but this specific wine is actually an area that's so new, it doesn't have a, an official AVA um, or Appalachian listing. It's actually a vineyard that's closer to the ocean than the Santa Rita Hills. So Santa Rita Hills is known as this, you know, cooler coastal region of California, but actually this specific vineyard that this Pinot comes from is even closer to the ocean. So it's a fully destemmed Pinot, but it's trying to capture freshness through its proximity to that cold ocean current. But then yeah. at the same time, this particular wine is from the 2015 vintage, which really for California is completely unusual. The yields were abhorrently low and it ended up meaning that the wines really kind of across the vintage have a lot more density and concentration of flavor and producers had to really, um, think hard on their picking choices because when your yields on the vine are so low, it's easy for the ripeness to race and kind of get ahead of you before you can get the fruit off the vine. So, so I, again, I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on this wine and you know, what, why this what are the soils like here? What are the soils like? So they're really, um, that particular area, they're uh, really mixed sedimentary. So kind of san pretty, sandy soils um but there's a little bit of diatomaceous earth that goes through that area too and so it's a little bit of a mixed site in that way and this is um this is all destemmed yeah 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 full fully destemmed yeah, yeah. But what's interesting about this is like um i guess it's um nearly five years old now and it's it's, it's got a kind of like a a lighter red color than you'd expect from a pin it's got a little bit of bricking at the rim it's got signs of a first the first signs of development but on the nose, beautifully, 
beautifully aromatic. Um, it's this lovely um, sweet and savory. It's, it's got the sweet fruit, but it's got this really appealing savory elements as well. Well, the thing I think with Adam, Adam's wines, even across the stylistic evolution he's gone through, they, they've always beautifully captured both, that sort of fruit expression with savory elements. And I think that also speaks to his respect for the region that he's making wine from. And in the palate, there's, there's, a, there's a lovely um, elegance to it with, a, again, some of these slightly savory components, um, savory, spicy notes, but sitting very nicely with quite sleek, wild strawberry red cherry fruit it's really quite distinctive mm -hmm. it's a really unique area and again it's kind of been emerging this area that again it's further west or closer to the ocean than even than santa rita hills so really um tucked up quite close to the town of lompoc and um and so it has you know it's really it's an emerging region it's newer vineyards in this area kind of just the last 10 years they've been going in there but it's really it's one of the the really unique parts of California right there. Quite a unique style actually, really, really, but a beautiful wine. I think it's fantastic. Um, it's, and it, it's very, it's not like I'm, I can't compare it with anything, you know? Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, one of the hallmarks of great wine is uniqueness. And I, I think that, you know, as, as these producers are, have become more willing to explore and like more willing to trust the journey, as you've put it, they've also become more willing to try wines from less explored regions. And this one, this particular Pinot is a great example of that. And we've had two wines, I think to, to this is the real California. I think that these first two, whether they're distinctive fine wines, they, they come from interesting vineyard sites and they're made in a sensitive way. And it's, so these two wines so far have been really just very exciting for me. That's and great. That's what well, I look for in wine. Yeah. It's fun too because they're from almost opposite parts of the state, you know, very yeah. far north, almost as far north as you can grow vines, and then almost as far south as you can grow vines, um, but both relatively yeah. coastally influenced. Yeah. Well, and so let's go ahead and look at, um, we want to talk about Cabernet too. And, you know, one of the questions that came up um, around IPOB, again, just to clarify, In Pursuit of Balance is no longer an active group. Um, and um, it existed for five years and then they disbanded. And its focus was specifically on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which we've just talked about. But the influence was actually felt across varieties in general and definitely felt outside of California as well. Um, but I think, I think going back to the point you were making, IPOB is just one example of, of producers becoming more invested not necessarily in changing what they were literally doing, but in thinking about and considering what am I doing and why am I doing it? What's the relevance there? And that, you know, that's this important part of a producer's development is, you know, considering why am I doing these things? And sometimes in asking those questions, you keep at it the same way, but, um, but now you understand yourself better. So, because I think just to cut in, I think it's yeah. very important to point out that you know you don't always have to have revolutions. We can have evolution as well, and I think that um, you know, and also there's always going to be to every culture there'll always be a counterculture, right. and and I guess some people naturally get drawn to the counterculture. But I think what's interests me about these discussions is it that I don't want this to be a countercultural discussion. We don't just be defining ourselves by what we stand against. We want to define ourselves by um, what we stand for. And I think that it's so easy to position yourself. Like I think, I, like, I love the natural wine movement, but so, so often they position themselves by what they object to and what they find objectionable and what other people are doing wrong. And I think that's a, that's a real shame because I think let's, let's define ourselves by what we stand for. And, be cultural and not just countercultural, if you see what I mean. Because the part of the, I mean, part of what's implicit in what you're saying is that if you're only ever defining yourself against other things, you're actually not asserting your own position. Yeah. You know, you're actually not clear about who you are because you're not clear about what you stand for. So you become dependent on the other cultural position so that it's you like can Peter Pan. It's like Peter Pan, isn't it? Isn't it? It's like, I always think, do you ever see that movie Hook? Yeah. There's a really yeah. Good, with, with Robin Williams yeah. and, um, and, um, and um, yeah, so, so Hook can't exist without Pan. 
And when Pan comes along and he's this fat sort of flabby um, American executive who is uh, no opposition whatsoever, Hook's identity is called into question because he hasn't got this figure to define himself against. Right. And I think it's sometimes we do that in the wine world. It's like, it's, you know, if we haven't got anyone to argue against or define ourselves against, then how do we define ourselves? Well, and so the third wine that you selected, I think is a great example of a producer that's always known who it is and always known what it wants to do. You know, we've talked about producers and how they evolve over time, but Smith Madrone, the third wine you picked, you know, Smith Madrone gets started in the 1970s, two brothers that move into the mountains and, and start making Cabernet, Chardonnay and Riesling. They actually dallied with Pinot for a while, um, you know, as many people do, but they, um, but there's this way in which Smith Madrone is this stalwart, you know, just this committed, they've always been committed to this like fresher, lighter, honest sort of approach to winemaking, but they're in, and they're an interesting, um, at the, even though they're speaking from this position of clearly asserting the kind of wine they believe in, they're, they end up, I think, being an interesting point of conversation in, rela in relation to Napa Valley more, more broadly. Yeah. Could you speak yeah. to, you know, why this wine? You know, what is it about this wine that stood out to you? So right, I, I'd kind of sort of heard of Smith Redrone before. And then I, um, uh, uh, maybe a couple of months back, I got sent a bottle of the, um, this, this particular wine, the, the 2015 um, Cabernet Sauvignon. And I was like, wow, this is, this is what excites me about Napa Valley and Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon in particular, because it's such a distinctive wine. It's got so much character and poise. And um, I, mean, I just love those aromatics. This, this is like um, um, this essence of Cabernet. It's got the sort of black currant, black currant bud. It's got some savory notes. It's got just the tiniest hint of mint, I think, as well. And and these dried herb characters. It's almost like a Mediterranean version of Cabernet, Mediterranean right. climate version of Cabernet. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, um, but it's, there's no excess there at all. It's, it's this beautiful fusion of all these elements that, uh, and, and it's fabulously um, aromatic. And then in the mouth, this real concentration of flavor and a, a sort of dryness to the, to the blackcurrant fruit but also, um, also some um, beautiful structure. It's like a wine that you taste now and you think this has got freshness, it's got structure. All the flavors work in harmony, but it's clearly a young wine, even at almost five years of age, that, that, is, that has got a lot of time on its side. This is gonna last for a while. Yeah, and, um, well, and their wines really I mean, this, do, too. I've been able to- this, um, For me, it's- Sorry, it's just, for me, it's so exciting because it's like, you know, you'd sell her this confidence and it's not, it's not spoofy at all. It's not overripe. It's not trying to seduce you with sweetness. It's not trying to seduce you with oak. It's, 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 about the, it's almost like the, a really intelligent interpretation of the place. I've been up Springer Mountain a couple of times and you see that place and you think this, this wine speaks to me of mm -hmm. that place, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, there's a real, there's a real fresh element to it too. That's so nice to find in Cabernet. I think Cabernet in some ways has gotten a bad rap um, with people assuming it has to be a ripe round wine. But in my mind, Cabernet is, a, is an upright wine. It's a stand up wine. It has integrity and structure. And I feel like this wine really expresses, expresses those aspects of the variety. The other thing about- So Cabernet, Cabernet does have a mid palate hole, but- um, it's interesting, this has got, I think this, uh, um, if I'm correct in thinking, this is around 16% Cabernet Franc as well. Yes, yeah, so it's which primarily... Fills in that, mm -hmm. fills in that hole a, a little bit, but also it, it has a little austerity to it, you know, which I think is appropriate for this sort of wine, you know. And, well, um, and the... if, you want to, if you want to get Cabernet Sauvignon that's sweet and smooth and has a full mid palate, you, you have to ripen it to a point where... Um, where you've lost a lot of the place, and I and I think you've 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 got a caricature of a wine. I think that that Cabernet is not going to be a sweet, easy variety. Mm -hmm. Cabernet is always going to have a bit of grunt. That's why we love it. You see, when you see the when you see the vines and you see the the, 
those um, relatively small berries with open clusters, you know, the, you know Cabernet is going to be reasonably tannic and, and quite grunty, and that's why people love it. But it's, this is such a good example of a wine with an incredibly long finish. And, um, you know, so you have that structure you're talking about, the tannin you're talking about, but like with so much um, length that it, yeah. the, the palate kind of keeps refreshing itself you know, yeah. even now minutes later after tasting. The thing too about this wine is I think it's a, it's important to, you know, you, you talked about how California has been a leader around the world in the conversation around ripeness and around intervention. But I think this wine also points out that California really is the place that established the idea of mountain Cabernet. You know, it didn't, yeah. mountain Cabernet as a category literally did not exist until producers like Smith Madrone went up into the mountains and it, there are now, there are now other mountain Cabernets in the world, but California remains really the only place that truly has mountain, mountain Cabernet as, as yeah. a unique category of wine. Yeah. Do you want to speak to the, you know, the contrast you see between something like mountain Cabernet and Cabernet more broadly, which is a little bit of a hard question, but. No, do you know what? I think that, I, I, look, I will defer a bit to your much broader experience of, of Napa. I've been a few times in Napa, but, but I've, I'm, I've been enough that I've kind of caught some of the themes and tasted quite a few of the wines. And, you know, it's, uh, I've got so many questions in my head still, but I, I can't reliably um, speak to the difference between Mountain Cab. I mean, I can, I can speculate in, from a relatively few data sets, data points, sorry. Um, um, but um, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's really fascinating. One of the things that really interested me was the idea that you're on a mountain, so you're higher up, but you you have a slightly warmer climate because you're you're often above the fog line, and so actually in in the growing season, it's a little it's, it's higher up but it's warmer, which is kind of inverse to the normal rules. Normally, you'd think if you're up the mountain that your climate would be cooler, but if you if you're not experiencing the fogs then then you've you've kind of twisted that round a little bit because i think that all these air currents and fogs and everything are a, a, a really extra interesting extra layer of terroir in, in 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 many californian regions yes for sure one of the things that i've found in trying to grapple with uh what it, what does it mean to make mountain cabernet or mountain wines in general there's um the, you know, what we mean by warmer very much depends on elevation. So if you're significantly high, what, you'll, what will often happen is you'll have warmer peak potential temperatures, but, um, but not necessarily warmer overall accumulated temperatures. And yeah, Smith Madrone is that sort of, is that elevation, but a kind of moderate elevation where their peak, their peak daytime temperatures actually generally are less, um, are not as high as peak valley floor temperatures, depending on where you are in the valley, of course. But, they're, um, but the decrease in temperature at night is also lessened. So they're actually- Oh, I see, that, yeah, yeah. That is, it's actually a more even ripening because there's uh, less of a diurnal shift between peak daytime and peak and, and lowest nighttime. And and presumably so that, in the mountains, you're dealing with much, much bonier soils. So you've not got the- the mix you've not got um some of the slightly richer soils um you've got these bony soils that, that so that's going to be an interesting difference as well isn't it especially with yeah. regard to the tannins i think yeah so uh, one of the questions that's coming in though is as you taste this uh you know this cabernet are there analogies uh in the world that you would want to compare it to are there are there other wines that the smith madrone reminds you of it's a really good question So first of all, I'm never going near Bordeaux for this. It's just it's just a different wine, different climate, yeah. different you know, totally different. Um, I really like this. I like this a lot more than most Bordeaux, to be honest. It's just because I like what I quite like is the is the focus, the aromatics, and then that beautiful structure and everything working in harmony. Um, it's nothing like um, going to other places of Cabernet Sauvignon around the world. It's nothing like Washington State. It's quite different, I think. Um, it's nothing like, um, where else does Cabernet? I mean, um, 
you've got Kunawara and Margaret River in Australia, the two main Cabernet regions there. And, have, and there's a little bit of similarity that, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of similarity between some of the good examples from, um, from Margaret River in particular, because there can be this taut character with quite yeah. ripe fruit. Because this is, yes, 14.3% alcohol. It's not like a shy wine but it doesn't taste ripe at all. Physiologically, it tastes cr quite crunchy and fresh. Uh, let's think, I mean, I remember there's, there was a wine from Provence um, called Domaine du Barouel that, that, was, that I used to, when I, my early wine drinking career, it was like a warm climate Mediterranean Cabernet that was picked so early that you had to wait 20 years to drink it. It was like, but it was beautiful, but it was like, it was just an, an immortal wine. Um, and so those, I think some of that compression and structure reminds me of this a little bit. So the warmer climate, but picked really the right yeah. time. Well, and I love how burns. aromatic it is, you know, and, yeah. and one of the other things um, that um, Gillian is pointing out here too on, on comments is that the, um, a lot of mountain vineyards, because the terrain is so rugged, they end up being planted very, very close to forests because California mountains in general, broadly speaking, especially in the north, are really covered in, in mixed types of um, conifer forests or really, or madrone or bay, like really resinous aromatic plants. And there is a bit of that in this wine, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. I and think we know I see where you're going there. Because... Influence, influence the flavors of the wine too. And so I think some of the aromatics okay, yeah. we get from Mountain Cabernet really can play into their proximity to, to forests. Um, this is a really good point. Um, it reminds me a tiny bit of, so I know it's different mountain, but my, my Camus, I, I find that's it's, it's that same sort of crunch and precision. Um, another mountain site, but different mountain. But um, yeah. Well, so we're almost out of time, but one of the questions that's coming in from Melody is just, you know, we talked about diurnal shift. And I think, I think sometimes um, com public conversations around wine sort of you know, like to simplify and make and assert claims. And in many cases, the diurnal shift, a big diurnal shift can be a benefit to a wine because it does help often retain acidity, you know, because the wine, the vine stops respiring below a certain temperature and evening temperatures will often get there. But actually, um, regions with a more even overall temperature can also be a benefit in a different way. And so this plays into, you know, how does your site inform the winemaking? Do you want to briefly comment on, on how you see this relationship? Uh, this, is, this is a really interesting point because I know a lot of that you, you summarized the, the, the received wisdom on this quite well, which is that, you know, if you don't have respiration, you keep your asset more. So, so, so diurnal shifts are really great. But I know that there's this, this well-known viticulturalist, well, not a horticulturist from Australia, John Gladstone, has written some quite influential books um, and he's thought very carefully about all these effects. And he's really quite keen on the idea that those big dial shifts aren't, aren't as good as we think they are. And so his argument is that actually um, steady, even ripening without big dial shifts is even better. All mm -hmm. we can say is they're probably different. Yeah. And there isn't enough evidence pointing one way or, or the other at the moment. Um, it's, like anything with viticulture, it just so much depends on the, where you are, the site, yeah. the variety, your stylistic goals. Um, yeah, it's, the, it's really hard to say. Yeah, I know for sure. Anecdotally, just, you know, trying to talk to producers that have worked in both situations. Anecdotally, um, I've had people say that, you know, the way that the tannin marries to the flavor, to the acid changes you know, if there, if you have big swing shifts, the vine is always also kind of shifting versus if yeah. you have a more even ripening, the things kind of marry together in a more intimate way, you know, but that's totally anecdotal. Mm -hmm. So we're almost out of time, but um, Rebecca's asking one last question that will be interesting. I do want to actually point out that so I'm very excited because one of the things you're working on um, and for the first time for you is a whole, an entire book on how viticulture has evolved and like what, kind of the new direction that directions that's going, which is really exciting. And that won't be out um, and certainly until well into next year, but, but you've done a lot of work as we've been talking about on low inter low intervention wines. And so Rebecca's asking, do you have any thoughts on kind of the direction this sort of perspective is headed, the direction wines made in this kind of way are headed? Well, I think it's where we've kind of, 
this is my view, and it's a, only a personal view, is that we've come to the end of the natural wine era. So natural wine is kind of like, yeah, we did done that. Now we're seeing an integration of these ideas in conventional winemaking, and we're seeing a massive sea change in terms of viticulture. I think that uh, that's underway now. I don't think we'll have glyphosate for very much longer. So herbicides, herbicides are kind of going to disappear from the viticultural toolbox in many countries. And that's going to require a real shift of, I mean, it's going to cause a lot of problems financially for many growers, but it's, it's going to be a sort of like a real shift in the way people approach their vineyards. And I think that, that um, I just hope that some of these changes that have taken place in the last few years percolate through to the, to the, the big wine companies, um, you know, the, the, the huge ones who make, lots and lots and lots of wine because it's all very well having people farming more sustainably in small vineyards and small domains but what we really need is we really need to see some of these changes in the viticulture and winemaking approaches going through to commercial wines that are in big production and i know there's financial implications of that but i think that sometimes to farm unsustainably is not acceptable we you know it's you it's you can't you can't let next generation pick up the tab. It's just morally wrong to farm. I don't care whether your market pressures are pushing you to farm unsustainably. And by sustainable farming, I mean farming that we can do for the next 100 years. If you can't carry on farming that way for 100 years, that's not sustainable. Even if you've right. got certificates, that's not sustainable. So we have to think, and also the other, you know, we're, we're in this very tricky position now where, where there's so many new realities to adjust to but one of the new realities is is the whole carbon footprint and climate change issue um, uh, that's so you know wine is going to the whole wine world i think is, is heading for some some speed bumps in the road but hopefully it will emerge stronger and um better afterwards even though it's going to be a painful transition it's like when you first try running i, m I remember i signed up for a marathon <laughs> yeah. one of my friends yeah. she said run the med marathon with me i'd never run five kilometers in my life before <laughs> yeah. and i had 14 weeks before the marathon right yeah so i emerged leaner and fitter but it was pretty brutal yeah you know, no that, it's that a horrible getting ready for, so it's like you know we, we we've got a marathon to run so we need to we haven't got long to train for it so we need to start training for it now that's the way i think in terms of the whole wine world and I'd just love to see um, the big producers um, actually making more interesting wines, you know, that with, that, with the less makeup, you know, we don't need wines with makeup. We, we, it's better to be true than to be good. We want to be good, but it's first of all, start being true and then hopefully we can be good, good as well. The, the thing to, to point out too is that it's the bigger producers that have the capital for the changes they make to really make an impact. You know, and so, you know, one of the things that's been great to see in the last few years around your point of climate change is, you know, companies like Jackson Family have partnered with well, companies like Torres. Exactly. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons I chose this wine, the, the Copan, the Copan that's yeah. Jackson Family wine. And they are, they are, um, they're signed up to some pretty strong commitments, you know, around this. And the new, new generation in Jackson Family is interested in the environment, you know, and that's pretty cool. Well, and they're, you know, they've made a really strong commitment and they're trying to influence the conversation, certainly here in California, but very much internationally. And, and that's, that's one of the things I think, you know, the public conversation in wine can really easily disparages larger producers. But I think that we ha it's important to step back and ask, wait, wait, you know, what are the advantages of having capital behind you? Well, you can make a difference and you can drive the conversation. And so that's that partnership between Jackson Family and Torres is such a great example of yeah. really intentionally choosing to drive a conversation that we all need to have happen. You know, but yeah. we are okay. we we are out of time. And I, you know, thank you so much for for uh, sharing this conversation publicly. I, I'm, um, you know, the truth is like the I, I got to know you online and then was able to meet you in one of those early um, early iterations of you coming to speak at IPOB years and years ago now. But the, you know, the friendship I have with you through wine has been so informative and so influential for me. And it's, um, it's just, it's a great pleasure to um, be able to share that publicly. I'll also say that I don't know if there's anyone else in wine that can make me madder than you can, <laughs> but... <laughs> 
that that's actually a compliment. Like I say that because you and part of why that I made you true. mad. When did I make well, you mad? Oh, it's been forever now. But I but the th I've <laughs> actually spent time thinking about what is that about? And it's that I really care about these conversations and that and there's a way in which we can engage from a kind of mutual respect and mutual commitment and and because I care, you can make me mad. And so um, it's been a long time since that's happened, but I, but I just kind of tongue in cheek bring it up to say thank you, yeah. and I, and that it's a pleasure to be able to share the conversation publicly in this way. No, it's any time, Elaine, you're 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 a legend. You're one of the best at doing this I know in the business. So it's always quite fun. You know, I look forward to these chats. Like, um, it's going to be fun. Right? It's going to go quickly, and then I wish there was more. You know. Yeah. No. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you again to everybody. It's been so fun to see comments coming in from literally all over the world. And it's always um, such a pre pleasure to share these conversations and try to build in relation to your questions too. So thank you for everyone to being here today. Great. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so just as a reminder, a recording of today's webinar will be published to the California Wine Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And we will email all the participants with the link to the video. We hope you will join us next week as we continue this new chapter of uh, Behind the Wines. And Elaine will tour California's diverse terroirs from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara, up to Napa and Sonoma with geologist and terroir specialist, Brenna Quigley and Michael Sager, director of Sager and Wild in the UK. So that will take place on Tuesday, July 28th at 10 a.m. Pacific. Thank you. <laughs>